Hi, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us for uh, the arts panel uh, for this conference on appreciating a framed NFT artwork. Um, I'm Charlotte Kent. I'm the moderator with our panelists. One of them is uh, fixing a little tech issue. No surprise, we're used to that these days. Um, and we'll bounce back in uh, in a moment or so. But, uh, and there he is. Uh, let's see if it works. So, um, as people would sort of deal with the various tech issues that abound in our hybrid lives these days, uh, one of the things that's been coming up around NFTs is this sort of shift over into physical locations, this thing of framing NFTs so that people can hang them on walls. We've seen notable uh, web-based gal galleries like Artblocks open up locations in Marfa, Texas. Um, Super Rare today, for example, has a gallery opening in New York. Uh, we have people at home looking to be able to hang them on their own walls. It's just a sort of pervasive thing. So one of the things around that is that it brings up what's happening with NFTs, this idea of this sort of digital medium that was moving and that was not static in the way that we associate with wall hanging, suddenly becoming entering this other space. So one of the things we're going to try and talk about today is that, like, what does it indicate that we have this shift? But the other thing that I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to talk about is really the concept of framing, right? This, the, the panel sort of asked a question, like, if painting was a display of wealth, like, what does it mean that NFTs are now shifting into this space? And the argument can be made that the wall isn't particularly indicative of that when Twitter can make you pay to have your profile pic be whatever NFT you want. But it does suggest that there's some kind of shift happening in the way we think about our art in general. And so how are NFTs framing certain issues in mainstream contemporary art discourse? Um, but then also how are they framing larger social issues as a part of introducing new ideas, new topics, new practices, new ways of engaging in our increasingly hybrid realities? So those are some of the things I hope we'll get to cover today in our brief time together. Um, and I've asked the panelists to introduce themselves somewhat briefly, um, just to speak about where they're coming from in the conversation around NFTs, and then we'll get started. So, um, Scott, maybe I could have you begin. Perfect. First of all, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, we're very excited to be a part of this group. Um, and so I'll give you a little bit about my background. Uh, I've been in crypto since 2013. Um, and then around 2017, I started building active infrastructure for blockchain technology. Uh, previously, I co-founded a company called Portis. Portis was a standard Web3 provider. So first there was MetaMask, then there was Portis. And our whole theory was really easy onboarding so that the everyday user can use a DAP, a decentralized application whether it was for DeFi or marketplaces or DAOs. Um, and what we enabled people to do was log in with an email and password on any device, any browser, and you weren't locked in. And then we encrypted the private keys with end-to-end -end encryption. We were one of the first wallets to support NFTs back in 2018 natively so that you could actually see your NFTs in your wallet. Um, we helped Fiat Unwrapping become a thing from credit card to crypto, credit card to NFTs in 2018, uh, as well as do uh, multi-chain support. Uh, we were the first wall to support Matic Network, which became Polygon. Um, after supporting over 500 plus companies in the ecosystem from OpenSea, Rarible, Uniswap, SushiSwap, Yearn Finance, Maker, Down More, we were acquired by Shapeshift, uh, uh, one of the oldest exchanges in the ecosystem. During that acquisition, my friends who are artists, curators, and collectors were like, Scott, you've been working with NFTs for so long, there must be a better way to enjoy it beyond the phone, beyond the computer, beyond retrofitting and hacking into a TV. I was like, that's a great question. Let me think about that, um, which led me to creating a company called Lago. Um, and I'll, I'll get into Lago. Uh, I don't know if Charlotte wants me to get into the background of Lago now uh, and the problems that we solve, um, or we could talk about that part of the Why don't you just briefly introduce it just like in a quick minute, just what Lago is for the audience. Sure. So Lago is a, a, a frame for minted works of art. It's a frame that is square by shape, which natively communicates to the blockchain. It does four core things. Um, one really simple mobile application that enables you to log in, sync with a wallet by authenticating, uh, and then being able to display your works of art uh, on frame. 
Second, we have a curation aspect. So we work with different tastemakers and curators that are able to upload their art lists to be discovered by other people within the Lago ecosystem to sort of cut through the noise of the marketplaces. Uh, and then third, we have a whole authenticity and provenance layer. So we actually pull that metadata from on-chain and say what you're showing is owned by you. So you can sort of flex that muscle that you own what you show versus things that are not owned by you. Uh, and then fourth, we really try to push the boundaries of experience um, between being a display and being a canvas for creators to create upon by having this open API ecosystem to create into our hardware by controlling our soundbar or controlling our gesture control cameras so that if Kevin wanted to create a piece that when I walk by, I could do a, a gesture control that maybe unlocks a special piece or access to his next artwork or an event is. Um, we're trying to really bring community into this and how it interacts at home and at galleries. Um, and as you said, Charlotte, about Super Rare opening up, uh, we are part of that gallery opening up in New York today. Great, well, I'll see those works later. Thank you, Scott. Um, Ian, could I have you introduce yourself? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm Ian Borland. I'm an art historian. I'm based at Georgetown in D.C. and uh, I write for a lot of art magazines and have done for about 15 years. Um, I'm a contributing editor at Freeze uh, out of London. Uh, so NFTs have entered my sort of field of vision really uh, sort of intensely uh, in the last year, year and a half. Uh, I'm sure you kind of experienced the same thing, Charlotte. So um, I'm trying to sort of figure out how NFTs and the larger sort of blockchain space interface with the art world as we have done it and as it's iterating right now. And so there are a lot of different layered themes there. Um, certainly, I'm thinking about the ways in which uh, NFT art accelerates a lot of uh, sort of latent trends in the 20th and 21st century art, uh, sort of uh, populism, anti-elitism, the uh, post-authorial world, greater inclusiveness, and even ideas like Duchamp's idea of the ready-made, the idea that the frame of the institution or, or the financial sphere gives meaning aesthetically or otherwise to a work of art. So obviously a sort of endlessly fascinating sort of series of, of questions posed. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the framing question, I think, comes into that level of the ready-made on one hand and on the other, the sense in which I, I've, I've wondered if uh, this digital space is accelerating as a sort of beyond the traditional confines of the art world. And if the idea of the frame or going back to these sort of brick and mortar spaces demonstrates the sort of durability of a, a more traditional model and, and wondering why that has so much persistence and in resonance for people. So I'm fascinated to learn from all of you here today. So thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, indeed, it's been, uh, there's certainly been more attention in the last year. Um, I wonder if Evan, I could get you to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Evan O. Yang. I'm the president of Animoca Brands. Uh, I have been in the NFT world for about a year, so not quite as much as uh, long as Scott. Uh, I came from traditional industries myself. I uh, came from banking, management, consulting. I ran buses for a while, um, and uh, and then I ran an expert network. And then uh, it just keeps it very fun. Uh, in terms of Animoca brands, we're one of the uh, leaders in the uh, blockchain uh, space, uh, starting with the, uh, what we'll call um, uh, digital asset ownership. Uh, but I think it's actually a lot easier if I would just uh, show you one slide, um, which, uh, which if I can get it on, it will be easier. Do you see this? Is the slide coming up or no? Um, there we go. There we go. All right. So, so yeah, just one slide. So what any Mocha brands does is that uh, we, we, uh, we basically, uh, we're about facilitating digital asset ownership and, uh, through a, an ecosystem of, uh, a play, uh, on the left side, we operate. So we're about, uh, about a dozen uh, operating companies, uh, from gaming to, um, to metaverse, et cetera, like the sandbox. Some of you might've heard of it. Uh, on the right side, we're about 280 investments that we have made across the value chain of the ecosystem. Uh, so from blockchain gaming to metaverse to art, to marketplaces, to decentralized finance, to infrastructure, such as Solana, uh, Polygon, et cetera. And our mission really is to uh, further uh, digital asset ownership via our ecosystem investments and our operations. And the core of what we focus on is to inject the blockchain know-how into these companies. So like tokenomics, design, community development, you know, listing, liquidity provision, et cetera. So that's a bit of what we do. 
Excellent. Right, Thank you. Sharing. I need to stop sharing. Stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There we go. Uh, Darian, can I have you jump in now, please? Sure. Yeah. My name is Darian Brito. I am originally from Ecuador, but I am based in the Netherlands. And I'm an audiovisual artist and a creative coder. So what that means is that uh, I used to be a classically trained musician. I used to play the violin and then I switched to making music with computers. Uh, so algorithmic composition. That's what I studied here in Holland. And uh, slowly as I was diving into computers, of course, I fell in love with programming in general. So uh, much more interested in doing computer graphics, generative art, and uh, the field of complexity, complexity theory. So that's how I got into this mixture of doing audio and visuals. Um, then further on, uh, I basically went so much into this, into this algorithmic art approach that I stopped writing music. And now what I do the most is just uh, what we call creative coding, which is this field of making art with code. And uh, my involvement in the blockchain has been as an artist. So I've been active on it for a bit over a year now. The platforms I've been active with were initially with Edblock Art, which is from a developer here in Holland as well. And further on, I went into Artblocks and they selected me for the curated section of Artblocks and I'm quite active there. And um, yeah, uh, I didn't really have much involvement from the economical side of things. Philosophically, I was quite affine to the idea of a blockchain from 2016. I attended many uh, events, many lectures, many things about it. So I was curious to or the philosophical part, not so much the economical part. And when I joined uh, Artlocks, especially then, uh, yeah, because it was so crazy, I was sucked into also considering the repercussions of uh, the economics of it. So, yeah, I would say my, my approach with blockchain technology is really from a creator perspective. I'm curious about the tech, what the limitations as an artist brings, especially this idea of generating artworks with code that is stored on chain. So not images or videos, but things that are alive, especially animations. That's what I mostly do on Artbox. So things that move, things that are animated in real time. And so, yeah, for their own looking forward to, to talk about this, which I find quite fascinating. Excellent. Thank you for that. And Kevin, um, do you want to pop in? Yeah, yeah. Hope, hopefully you can hear me. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the woods, so I don't have a great uh, connection. <clears throat> My name is Kevin Abosh. I'm an artist. I work uh, across a, a number of media, including uh, generative uh, methods like uh, artificial intelligence uh, and uh, blockchain I've been using as a method uh, in my practice of uh, making art since uh, late 2012, 2013. Um, my, my first uh, NFT wasn't uh, you know, one of the current protocols. Not, uh, it was an early uh, one. Uh, called uh, ERC twenty, uh, but it was it was unique and and non fungible. So what I'm saying is that it was sort of uh, <clears throat> wasn't an intention really to make an NFT per se. It just happened to be that it it was an NFT, and uh, I, I tokenized myself in 2018 in the form of 10 million works of uh, uh, virtual art uh, that were connected to some physical works that uh, incorporated my own blood in in an attempt to. Uh, meaningfully connect the physical and the virtual, which which I uh, which I think I did. And uh, aside from addressing matters of identity and value, uh, I try to uh, do my best to redefine the relationship between uh, collector and art, and artist and collector uh, in uh, in surprising ways. And and this uh, playground known as the blockchain uh, helps me do that. Great. So that gives us sort of an overview of each other and for the audience. I mean, I think I just want to launch right into this conversation about, um, you know, some people like to use words like digital and physical. I've been sort of leaning towards thinking about things in terms of virtual and tangible. Um, but whatever words we use, this notion of the fact that uh, part of the excitement, part of the sort of enticement of NFTs was originally that they were natively digital. And we've sort of seen this moment you know, in the past. And then all of a sudden, there's this shift that started to happen really 
concretely, I would argue, maybe six months ago around the sort of fall art fairs with an increasing attention towards displaying them, right? I don't think I've been to an art fair since uh, Miami where there hasn't been an NFT display at one of the booths, right? So there's a kind of normalizing there. And I'm curious what people think about that, both in terms of you know, how we don't like some of the displays, right? I'm sure Scott, you've got some opinions on that, right? But like that people have complained about the displays, um, but at the same time that we're doing it at all, what are we gaining and what are we losing? And it's a free for all, so jump on in. Well, I mean, I could, I could start and then I'm sure that uh, there'll be plenty of uh, agreements and disagreements in the in the panel, given the, you know, the, given the diversity of where we are. I, I actually think that uh, NFT uh, art is actually, you know, on the one hand, not that substantially different from owning a piece of physical art, right? It is still about appreciation, uh, about culture, about beliefs. Uh, it can be an investment as well and, uh, and what you yourself would stand for. But uh, on the other hand, it's it, 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 NFT art uh, could stand out uh, is that it also forms as a part of a community, right? Because it is on the blockchain, it is easy to know, quote unquote, know, right? Whoever has joined the community actually owns that particular NFT, right? Because it's very viable, right? So uh, if you look at Bored Apes uh, as kind of like one of the ones that have been most successful in the last 12 months, it just began as kind of like, you know, as a, a bit of a um, uh, kind of a funny thing to make fun of the world of how um, some of these, um, uh, you know, uh, digital natives would live in future. Uh, but then it created a really buzzing community. Uh, thereafter, um, uh, you know, it created sort of, you know, drop your potions for you to make two mutants, uh, mutant apes, and then drop your cannon. Uh, thereafter, drop you some ape coins, and then it dropped uh, the, the same owner's, uh, you know, land. So there's a there's a promise of what you call continuous utility, which is ultimately what the space is about. So rather than sort of just thinking about you know what that particular entity stands for, there's also uh, additional utility that's dropped as part of what the, the digital asset community is ultimately about. So the belief in that continuous utility actually drives the adoption and the buzz around that particular uh, piece of art, right, which is a little bit different. Um, but there are also sort of other examples as well, which are, you know, sort of rows and then decline like Asuki. Uh, some people might be familiar with that right. project. But, but Evan, just before we go into more examples of it, I mean, I think for the thing is the continuous utility doesn't require a physical frame. Right. One can enjoy that without having to bring it into the physical space. So just to bring it back, because you did bring up a few things I do want us to get to. But just to bring it back to this moment of like actually framing it, putting it on the wall, having it be something that appears to be stable, specifically in the context of the fact that it doesn't need to be. Um, I'm just wondering if any of the rest of you want to speak yeah. to that. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, go, going back to 2018, I can remember being in uh, I was in Japan having a conversation with uh, a, a rather large uh, crypto trader, uh, you know, let's call him a whale or a billionaire, whatever you want to call him. The guy, the, this guy spent a lot of money on, on Bitcoin and he couldn't understand how I had, uh, I had a, my art was virtual, it was immaterial. He asked me, how can something that I can hang on the wall or hold in my hand, or in my case, even see, how could that have value? And I, and I laughed, I'm like, this is coming from a guy who buys mechanically something almost identical it's just called Bitcoin instead of a, you know, a work of art. Now, now things have changed a bit over the years, um, but and I, and I do believe in large part it's a generational issue. Uh, I don't think uh, my my kids who are twelve and nine they have you will never convince them that a physical asset is necessarily intrinsically more valuable than a, than an immaterial one. Um, but something that I've found that that definitely speaks to. Uh, the need or the want to uh, frame a work, uh, an NFT, a digital work, and put it on your wall, is that after uh, you know the better part of a year, a couple of years of a frothy uh, uh, NFT art market, um, 
it's 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 funny, but it's it's almost like a novel idea, a revolutionary idea now that that you might collect something physical from these same artists that you've been collecting vir virtual work for for such a for such a long time, and and uh, we were talking about how maybe art is an investment, and or people also buy art because they want to share in the experience uh, of the work, or or even as a form of pro uh, social proof uh, and validation, um, but uh, when you uh, have spent, uh, however, amount uh, much of money and and collected hundreds, if not thousands, of NFTs, just like your friends. Suddenly, it becomes uh, uh, from a from a seemingly from a status perspective, you, they want the physical. So, because I'm I'm actually getting people saying they want, you know, the old school, uh, you know, work on paper. But um, I think a, a nice uh, happy medium, uh, so to, no pun intended, uh, is uh, is a digital frame. Now, yeah, you have uh, you have. It, it's great that Lago has. Uh, it, 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 I'm yet to hold one in my own hands, but from what I understand, they've gone a long way to, uh, 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 you know, increasing the quality. Because up until now, you've been you've been uh, at the mercy of uh, whatever kind of television they they find at the big box store and throw on the wall, and you know, you you move like five five degrees to the side, and the colors shift, and you know, so there are a lot of technical issues to, that 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 were obviously taken into consideration uh, by Scott and his company uh, to enhance that uh, experience. Um, but so I wondering... myself... I'm just, uh, Kevin, I'm just wondering, you know, Scott, can you speak to some of the complaints that you received that were part of the process of designing Lago in the sense yeah. of what was the goal? Yeah, so um, I'll break uh, a couple things down um, from what we saw from the very beginning. The, the very beginning, there were sort of two sectors of people. Um, one I'll call the crypto OGs that already had massive collections of hundreds, if not thousands of pieces of work, even over a year ago. Um, and that's what really drove the, uh, the need for having a frame because they were asking, there must be a better way than trying to retrofit into TVs or, or, or hacking and building their own together. Uh, and then the second group, and then I'll get into the design and sort of like the problem solving that we sort of had to think about. The second group was the traditional collectors from the Christie's and Sotheby's and Phillips of the world, where, you know, they were learning about minted works of art and you know, they were having conversations about it and they inherently understood the value of it. However, for them to continue to acquire, it came down to, well, how do I enjoy it? Because these traditional collectors are, you know, above the average age of Kevin's kids, where they have been buying traditional art for quite some time, and they still want to sort of flex in their home and, and have a beautiful thing, a frame, which could stand side by side to their traditional artwork and still be able to display in home and a gallery, opposed to turning on a TV, watching Bravo or Super Bowl and being able to switch on the channel to some NFTs. They wanted to have something side by side with their traditional work. So some of the problems we encountered early on um, when trying to build a frame that can withstand the quality of traditional artwork was one, you, you needed something super easy that the average user, these traditional buyers from the Christie's and Sotheby's, not, not the OGs, right? Not the people that natively understand how to use a wallet, how to authenticate. Um, for them, it'll be very easy to use a product like Lago. Um, and we wanted to build something and make sure that we could solve the problem that even new buyers that don't even have a, a, a collection that can still purchase a Lago, see minted works of art and be educated and still enjoy um, works of the digital on frame. So I would say there's three core problems that we that we realized. Um, one, ease of use. Um, and we could get into what that means from, you know, a mobile application to signing a transaction on a wallet or even simply as discovering minted works of art. Which brings me to how do you discover minted works of art when traditional uh, uh, collectors, you know, they're not going to open sea and super rare and need to gateway and foundation and all these different marketplaces because there's so much noise. And how can you trust the projects if, if you're not, you know, spending all your time within these marketplaces and doing your research? Um, uh, so we wanted to build a trusted ecosystem, which the art within our curation was built by specific tastemakers that you have there for discovery and you're able to then purchase and find it very easily from trusted groups and individuals. I, I see the question. I'm, I'm gonna just pause you right there because since you brought up curation and it's come up a couple of times already, I think it's an important part of this conversation on framing, right? Which has to do with the fact that um, for, 
for most audiences that don't actually just want to spend their time scrolling through endless images, um, curation became crucial. Um, and I personally have argued this since the beginning that there was just no way that NFT art or art using NFTs in some fashion was going to be able to survive without curation. Um, it helps us see it better. Also, we depend on galleries, we depend on curators to help us understand the art, right? Any art, doesn't matter what it is. It can be a traditional marble bust sculpture, right? Um, so a lot of sites have also popped up that have done, you know, either curated sections or galleries have taken on some of that work. Um, but this brings us into something that actually Evan had brought up that I just want to speak to for a moment, which is the term NFT is this broad swath of work. And yet, because of the way in which it got very early on attached to these mega auction houses, it gets used as if we're talking about, and in fact, what is possibly one of the most niche areas in the larger blockchain landscape. I actually think what might be only a little more niche than what we typically consider mainstream contemporary art is poetry. And the poetry blockchain space is even smaller than art. But otherwise, I mean, gaming, which Evan brought up, um, music, I mean, these are collectibles are significantly larger portions of the market. So one of the things I want to just ask is how have NFTs framed the problem of what we mean when we talk about art? May I interject on, on this topic? Uh, so I, what I wanted to say is indeed, I find it very, it's a little bit strange that there's a need for validation from one aspect, from one side of the, of the public, from one side of the people who experience uh, digital art for the first time, perhaps, and people who traditionally have been connected for it for many years, because digital art is really old. It's nothing. There's nothing new about it, and also, uh, generative art is super old. It's from the 50s, or even if you want to go further back, it's from the 19th century when people were doing things with dyes, or even further back with textiles in the Andes. You know, people were using these techniques forever, and suddenly now, because of NFTs, as you say, there's a huge attention on the value of these things. But this this has been present forever. And uh, what I find an interesting phenomenon is the need for validation, that once you put a frame, you put it on the wall, then it becomes valuable, then it becomes art. However, one of the other strengths of digital art, um, as, a, as a creator, what, what draw me to it is the fact that you can copy it, you can send it to your friends, you can remix it, you can do all sorts of things with it. Now, uh, framing it on a wall, in my case, it, it feels a little bit of, a, of an oxymoron with digital art especially those that are animated, because it sort of kills the flow of what digital enables, particularly if it's something that is, is moving or particularly something that is, um, it needs to happen on the spot. Uh, so it depends, of course, of the, of the artists you're, you're willing to show, but it, it creates an interesting well, tension between I the tech. Say, I just Sorry. want to say I, I disagree with that only because that's a problem of using the wrong frame or display. But when you have a frame that has computing power built into it, do on-frame rendering and also exactly. a gesture to interact with the 3D capabilities um, and, in, and enable you to push the boundaries even further to think about how you create in a way that engages with your uh, with your buyers in person. Exactly. That's what that's where I was going to get at. Like uh, that, there's ways of showing of showing art in frames that that do not mean static frames that's exactly what you were saying so because the tech exists for a while what i didn't know it was possible yet is like an, a gpu embedded on a display for example that already allows for artists to create things that can be movable and the frame it doesn't necessarily need to mean a static piece that is in a museum in the traditional sense or what christie's or Sotheby's are usually uh, showing but it can be so much more because the tech is already there for a long time and this tension brings interesting uh, avenues to explore as as creators, but also collectors, and of course manufacturers. Like I'm really excited about learning now about uh, Lagos that there's this thing being built. You know, so we're so early, Charlotte, in this entire ecosystem. It's an education game still, and one of the benefits of a frame like Lago in public spaces is that it it, it bridges a gap between the virtual and the physical. Where what we do is we bring that metaverse home that you could teach and share and communicate. 
Um, and what you were talking about before about different terminology from NFTs to collectibles and music, I agree a thousand percent that NFTs, you know, it goes back to language, especially with new technology. And even at Lago, we try to stay away from saying NFTs. We try to say minted works of art because it describes what's being done using the technology of the blockchain and it's art. Um, collectibles is a collectible uh, as well. Um, and it, it really is how you reframe the language to understand the idea behind it. Um, but I'm thankful for uh, bridging that gap between the two because you know where Evan is putting his time and energy is building out this entire ecosystem. And by the way, Animoca is actually one of our investors. So um, I'm very <laughs> thankful for you know um, everything they've done in the ecosystem and they continue to do to support and bridge that barrier between the virtual and the physical. So the next thing I guess I want to say is, you know, I appreciate the minted works of art. And Scott, I will probably start using them more often. But just for today, just to keep it simple in my head, I'm going to say NFTs. One of the things that NFTs have done is really bring to the forefront the conversation about the role that market plays in mainstream contemporary art. So for those of us who are more on the, you know, we're looking at art, it's all art historical and theoretical and so on and so forth. Um, everyone's been confronted with the fact that, you know, if you weren't already, you're going to have to talk about, you're going to have to acknowledge the role of the market. Um, the downside of that is that it's made everything be about the market, right? And this is something, at least in my own writing, I've pushed hard against. Like, I'm not interested in writing about a market event. I'm interested in writing about the works and how we can think through them. But I'm just wondering... What do you all think of the frame of market as being as what role it's played and what benefits or negatives it's brought into the conversation around digital art, but also mainstream contemporary art? Look, you're you're always going to have your scammers and your people jumping in to earn a quick buck on top of any new technology. Um, however. Uh, the freedom that this brings for individuals in third world countries, even if you like, and I'm sure Evan will be able to speak more to this better than I can, what the gaming world has done um, when, you know, in, in specific parts of the world, when you're playing an NFT game and you're earning more money than ever before in your life in destabilized currencies, um, and now you can engage in a, a global economy on the blockchain, that's amazing. Um, and same goes for content creation, where it provides ownership for the individual. I mean, if you look at what Steve Aoki has said and Snoop and many other, you know, massive creators who have been producing music for decades, and yet on an individual mint for the first time, they've, done, they've made more in a decade uh, by connecting directly with their consumers. That's creating a, a whole new way to think about creation and content and ownership. Yeah, I, I mean, if, I guess you're talking about play to earn games, which is a whole you know, seven hour uh, conversation to be had. But, you know, as far as the market, the market goes and the implicit promise of the technology to uh, empower the uh, disempowered or the marginalized or disenfranchised, the fact is, and this is a fact, and everybody can go on to OpenSea and crunch the numbers themselves. If you take the United States, those that identified as professionally as artists made a fraction of a percent, a fraction of percent of those people made more than $10,000 a year. So under the poverty line. And, you know, yes, there will be those people who didn't make money pre NFT that do now. But statistically, it's still a fraction of a percent of the people who are minting NFTs, who identify as artists, who are making any profit. You know, Darian and I are very fortunate and we know others that are fortunate and that's fantastic. But we represent a sliver of a sliver. And so I, I pedal lightly on the on the uh, on the hype and the utopian uh, future that may or may not exist. Uh, in full disclosure, I've done some work with Animoca as, as well. And I, I'm very closely involved, has nothing to do with my, my practice as an artist. But I'm interested a lot in this so-called play to earn uh, thing. But I mean, I think that that conversation is a little bit too far away from the framing. But as far as framing the market, I, I always say, look, the, the, the complications and the corruptions that existed in the so-called traditional art market, uh, you can imagine that if you add crypto to the equation, it's, there, it's not going to improve matters. It's only going to, uh, it's like adding jet fuel to uh, something. So I think the, the, the positives can be amplified and the negatives can be amplified. But I don't think yet I've seen any quantifiable, uh, you know, global benefit to, uh, you know, that, that is truly distributed. I mean, 
I would, I, I mean, I think certainly the numbers speak to that truth. Every market report has sort of repeated what Kevin just shared. But I think one of the things, you know, just to sort of emphasize here is there are reasons to consider a ve- helpful that we have been forced to confront the kind of the role that the market plays and the way in which talking about money and talking about markets drives activity and drives interest. I mean, I think we've had such a blatant display of that, that it's helped bring around some people to think about why is it that that conversation can be such a powerful driver of interest, of activity, that there are maybe underlying you know, social and political issues to consider when the art itself, when the education itself, when the knowledge itself, when all of these other factors that play into what it is that blockchain can be in the space are not what is captivating. Um, and I think NFTs have framed that market activity for us in a way that is going to be hard to walk away from. Um, I'm realizing, unfortunately, I, this is was where I'd hoped we'd get to in the conversation. <laughs> um, but I also feel like there are uh, audience members who may have questions, and we only have about eight minutes left. So I do feel like we have to hand it over to them. Um, but I left us on a sort of intense note. So I'm just wondering, does anyone on the panel want to reply to that, that last statement I made? Uh, I'll say one quick thing. Um, uh, going back to um, the numbers, I, I think the big problem is that a lot of artists or people that wanted to become an artist or had art, they don't realize that in this space, community is everything. Um, and just by creating artwork and putting it for sale means nothing. Um, it, it, the, the energy and effort where one has to spend time is by engaging with the community. And that's everything. Uh, when you have a community behind you, whether it's a, a, a curator network, whether it's a, an auction house, whether it's other artists, whether it's whomever it may be, it really is about the community behind you. That'll enable your voice to be heard and your art to do well. Um, or and when we and when we and when we push out, and when we consistently push out that message that community is so important, we we suggest to artists, not just. Uh, uh, creators of collectibles and people in gaming that it becomes sort of a best practice that you have to have a discord you have to engage aggressively with a community which uh, i think they, there's many ways to have community i mean kevin you've been in ours for a long time you yeah. you have a native community into your life and same with many others um, so you have an organic you have an organic community but i think something that is happening and i'm worried about is groupthink that emerges out of a uh, uh, community gone out of control community with the shadow, the specter of a multi-billion dollar train steaming down uh, the tracks and anybody who has anything to say in slight opposition or even to question gets emerald. And, you know, not everybody is as brilliant as you uh, You are to make. Yeah, that's the problem yeah. though. The pendulum is going too far. One I way. would say just to add another note on this community issue, I think one thing that I've seen a lot more of in the last year among, you know, artists working with technology overall, Um, but I think that this is partly coming from the NFT space, is that they are recognizing their collaborators. There's just not been, you know, although we all know that typically artists working with technology have many people involved in producing a work just by nature of the difficulty of some of them. I have noticed consistently on web pages, the artists listing all the people involved, um, anywhere from lawyers to devs to operators. I mean, it's just been, so that's just to add to the mix, another side of the community conversation. Kevin, you bring up a good point, Scott, I hear you, but I just wanted to note, I would love to see a new best practice that includes any artist identifying the incredible number of studio participants or intellectual collaborators who are part of a project, because that really would break us away from what has traditionally been yeah. a super genius model. And, and by yeah, the way, right, I'm not, I, I, I think, you know, even though there, we have different degrees of bullishness, I actually both agree with Scott and Kevin, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, we have to remember how new the space is, right? We are in a, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're like, you know, we're, we're a couple of billion people, we're just just gamers is 3 billion already, right? A couple of billion people. We have eight, 82 million wallets, right? There are not that many collectors. Right? And then it's a space of 2021-22, sort of people talk about the year of NFT, but within that, there's all of euphoria of speculation as well, right? Which is which happens in any kind of you know internet boom. There's a third, there's Web three, right? 
And we've just sort of put things in perspective about, you know, what is the degree of innovation and then the, the risk involved if you're a speculator. And there are some who are actually patient collectors and who would, you know, uh, be, you know, uh, you're know, looking at holding it for a long term and re being part of a community, right? Ultimately, do not advocate speculation, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it is ultimately about, um, you know, what is real about this space, right? Which there's a lot more to be composed upon. I, I, I agree. Mean, is, uh, one final thing about this is, uh, yeah, I think that's, I, I'm totally agreement with Evan here that uh, it, it is, uh, sorry, with Kevin, I'm mixing up the names, um, that it is quite problematic in some sense, and there's many things that are hidden. And I just wanted to say one thing that is very personal, which I've been confronted a lot by being part of the space and from collectors too, uh, which is that I, I really don't think that art should have utility. And this is a mantra that is being said to us as artists. Where is the utility? Where is the roadmap? Where is the white paper? Where is this and where is that? Art should not have a utility, period. I mean, that's that's not what we're doing here as artists. And I think that's a, that's a something that we are being drawn into. Yeah, willingly. it's the conflation. Dead right, Darren. It's the conflation between the art NFTs, the collectible NFTs, and any other, any other NFTs. And that becomes the best practice. And for a young artist, someone who doesn't know what to do, they think, well, I'm not going to be successful unless I adopt these, you know, kind of bona fide commercial uh, tactics. And uh, I hope it's not the case that they, uh, that that's their only path to success. I think you'll start seeing groups like Lago and others. We're creating an artist fund that we can help lift up uh, uh, artists that are already out there and emerging artists to help them with their minting costs, to help them with their process. And then, you know, since we have that curation channel, being able to showcase it to real collectors that want to have art because the sake that they actually enjoy the art. And there are DAOs doing this too. But I think the point is we are, and maybe this, you know, speaks to me and Ian in particular as, you know, people who are professors as well, that there's a lot of education to be done around warning emerging artists about what it means to enter this type of space, um, that that might actually be a part of the inherent professionalization that has started to accrue in any kind of educational setting. Um, all right. So with two minutes left, <laughs> um, I'm wondering, uh, do any of the people in the audience have questions? It seems like there's a couple hands up. Um, Christina, did you have a question for us? I can't see. Um, there she is. Now you've got the mic, Christina. Hello. Actually, no, I didn't put a question, but uh, I found it very, very interesting. And this, um, this final idea about um, creating um, organic communities and about the danger, I found very, very interesting, very interesting. I'm going to explore it more, but thank you very much. It was inspiring for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's see. Kat, uh, did you have um, a question? I'm just trying to see through here. There you go. Tats, go for it. You should now have the mic. There you go. I, I just simply I want to ask a question that uh, what could be the like a breakthrough point that uh, NFT art gonna be totally in the next contemporary art level or that people buy beyond that like a concrete breakthrough point if you could say. I think is the question, what would make, what would constitute a breakthrough point where uh, minted works of art can be yeah, recognized yes. as mainstream contemporary art? Uh, what would constitute that breakthrough? Well, we're, we're seeing major, major museums uh, from the Hermitage to the Francisco Carolinum in Austria. I mean, a number of major institutions. Uh, are 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 doing are showing NFTs. So I mean, 
it's a validation game, and I and I suppose that's about some of the highest validation you can get. For me, that's more meaningful than the auction houses selling because they'll sell anything that they can make a buck off. Thank you. Um, I would also argue that um, there's recognition the fact that there are books coming out that are trying to do overviews of artists. I think it's important to recognize that there are collaborations going on now between you know web platforms and some of the mega galleries. Again, Artblocks and Pace collaborated with the Leo Villarreal one. Um, so I think those are all sort of... in. Indic indicative of the fact that it is becoming mainstream, hence some of the reasons some of us are so concerned about what that means and how, what kind of dam we're sort of unleashing. Um, other questions, let me just see. Um, well, real quick, Charlotte, to your, to your point though, I think what's fascinating maybe from our perspective is um, it, it, NFTs frame the market in this very, makes it very legible for us, but also we're looking at like canon formation from the ground up. So since there are so many NFT artists out there right now, it's a question of whom do we value? Which practices do we bring to the forefront? Who makes their way into those books? And is it just about the validation of the market or the auction house or certain curators? And it's fascinating to be able to see an entire new sort of ages of contemporary art sort of emerging <laughs> before our eyes and seeing how we, whom we value yeah. and how we do that. And as an art historian, I bet he's really interested. I bet you're really interested in how the those with money in this space, uh, which might be a slightly different demographic than in the so-called traditional art market, might be the ones underwriting the museum shows and underwriting the books and the gallery shows, and how over time that might actually influence aesthetic. Well, money and the art world have always gone hand in glove. Always. So, you know, <laughs> no, but it's just fascinating to see, again, the sort of acceleration in real time, yeah. But I also yeah. think it's one of the reasons, I mean, I've been fighting pretty ardently against the notion of coming up with too many terms, right? Like as writers, we're often asked to sort of to label, to define, to communicate. And yes, that's our job. And I, I understand that that's my responsibility. But at the same time, I mean, I think it's really important to recognize that a lot of this stuff is still emerging and that if we start trying to frame some of these different practices or some of these different aesthetics too soon, then we do a disservice to what it is that can actually emerge. And um, that in that sense, there is, I mean, artists have done a pretty impressive leadership job in the space of communicating what they value, of, you know, presenting works, of speaking. So um, just, to, just to point out that I, I'm also wary of too much. <laughs> definition happening right now I, I i'm excited about post nftism which is actually just nftism as in post internet art is to internet art yeah um <laughs> so we are technically out of time uh we've run out of time uh uh, there's a few other people who have hands up. Um, if any of our panelists have to leave, I want to recognize everyone's busy lives um, and or just choice not to have to do more free labor of being on a panel sharing your ideas. Um, but if you wish to stick around, I want to give uh, two of the other people who still have their hands up a chance to ask their questions. Okay. Um, Mari Abramovitz. Not popping up. Uh, Lucy. Well, this might be quite simple then. And Novo. Ah, well, none of them seem to be able to communicate, possibly because we are past time and so it's cut off the audience, which is my fault. Um, Thank you all. It has been such a pleasure meeting you. Hopefully, we'll, we'll only be for the first time. Um, and uh, I wish you well, and we'll see you in times to come. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very Thanks much. Charlie. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.